before we get started with the content, I just want to make mention, I know some of you have come to our uh, face, but um, for those of you that are new to JWA, our mission is to document Jewish women's stories, elevate their voices, and inspire them to be agents of change. And you are partners in that work. Without um, your work teaching on the ground and also your ideas and enthusiasm and questions which sort of drive our program development and our curricular development, we definitely wouldn't be able to do this work. So thank you so much for the part that you play in that and um, for sharing this with us. And also, this slide has been giving me trouble the whole week and I haven't been able to get it to work. There's supposed to be an arrow in between these two pictures, but um, our work at JWA is really about using these historical stories to ask some questions about who are these people, what was their experience, why did they do what they did, and use those as an entry point for exploring student identity. Who am I? Um, what do I believe? And how does who I am inform what I want to do and what impact I want to have on the world? So as we're going through this material, keep those questions in the back of your mind because that's always the, at the core of what we do. Um, I have some pretty ambitious goals for us today, and um, because of that, this is going to be a lot, we're going to be looking at a lot of different things and discussing a few different ideas together. Um, don't be overwhelmed by the amount of stuff because there will always be opportunities for you to um, go online and do more of your own reading afterward if you'd like. So um, we're going to look at some of the a little bit at differences between the northern and southern Jewish experience and think about um, what motivated these activists as Jews and as women to um, do this project and to participate in the civil rights movement. We'll be talking a little bit about if there's something um, special about women's only organizing, what can be useful about that, and then we'll be talking a little bit about um, what lessons or ideas we can bring from this content and into uh, our own communities and um, work or teaching that we might be doing there. And I think it's helpful, especially for you all as educators, to see the context of this lesson, particularly because of the way this particular lesson is um, laid out. So this is from our Living the Legacy curriculum, which is our, our social justice education project from this material. And that um, module is broken into three units. The first is about identity and action. Um, everything is based on primary sources, but really sort of getting some of the background about the motivations of Jewish activists you and their You are the only participant in the conference. Please press any key on your keypad to remain in conference. Um, that might happen again just as we're working out the kinks of this new audio setting, so thank you for your patience with that. Um, Unit 2, which is where this unit about Wednesdays in Mississippi falls, looks at a couple different um, methods of making social change, different ways of doing community organizing and activism. Um, and then Unit 3 takes that a step further to say, what was the impact of civil rights activism on the Jewish community? How did it impact um, African American and Jewish relationships? And um, what are the civil rights issues of today? So. That's where it fits, and the reason I think it's important is because the um, way that the lesson plan is written, it draws very heavily on comparing the Wednesdays in Mississippi model to the Freedom Summer model. So um, you may want to teach this with the Freedom Summer you lesson plan. You are alone you in the conference. More, You'll be disconnected. If you want some more background information about the um, Freedom Summer project, you can watch our online learning program recording. Um, or you can attend our future online learning program in May about um, Freedom Summer. Or you can use the approach that I'm going to model here, which is I'm going to give you some background information on Freedom Summer. You're welcome to download this PowerPoint presentation afterward and use it. Um, and then sort of go through and pick and choose or feel order the primary sources and the video clips in a way that's going to work for your setting. Um, and one other way that you could use this is to really use it as a way to explore the different experiences of Jews, Northern Jews and Southern Jews. So there's a great um, lesson plan in the first part, the unit one of this curriculum that talks about the experience of Southern Jews and has students um, simulate a board meeting of a Southern synagogue who's trying to decide whether or not they should host Northern activists. And that can be another really great entry point into this material. 
So with no further ado, I want to jump into learning more about Wednesdays in Mississippi or WIMS as sometimes we abbreviate it here. Um, and you'll definitely see that. So um, hopefully that's not too confusing. Um, and I just want to start by looking at some of the reasons that in, in research and oral histories, Jews cite for their involvement in the civil rights movement. And these are by no means comprehensive, but um, each of these different threads seem to play a part in the collective experience of Jewish activism. And I think looking at these different motivations for um, doing social justice work, there are probably some pieces of um, each of these reasons that also motivate you. So it's um, nice to start or, or at least at some point bring in some discussion of uh, why. Why do we as Jews or individuals get involved and um, get involved in making social change and doing activism? This is a timeline with some major landmarks from uh, the civil rights movement and I just wanted to show you where Wednesdays in Mississippi fell during um, that period in history. And it's important, you'll see why as the story unfolds, but it's important to note that this happens um, during 1964 in Mississippi at the same time that the Freedom Summer Project was happening in Mississippi. Um, so just a few words on Freedom Summer to that end. So um, Freedom Summer was a project of the Council of Federated Organizations or COFO, which was this umbrella group of civil rights organizations that were working in Mississippi specifically. So the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, those groups got together and had this Mississippi specific group because Mississippi had really, really entrenched uh, problems. It's, it was known as being sort of a hotbed for these problems and for activism. Um, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee nationally also played a really big part in um, Freedom Summer because they are the ones that helped recruit volunteers, do training, um, advise the Mississippi activists. So this was a project sort of between those two groups. Um, and it's interesting to note when talking about the civil rights movement in general and also looking at Freedom Summer specifically that it's estimated that Jews made up a up to half of the white volunteers who were um, coming and, and doing activism during this time period, which is notable because Jews made up such a small percentage of the population. So it's always worth calling that out. I think people feel really great about that number. It makes people feel good and connected. Um, it's also uh, ties into some of those questions of why. What is unique about the American Jewish experience that causes Jews to step up into these roles more than maybe other subsets of the population. Um, and that these Northern activists were partnering with Southern activists who had been working on these projects and similar projects for many years before that. So um, this was a culminating project in a, a long and rich legacy of civil rights activism in Mississippi and in the Delta. And Freedom Summer covered three main projects. One was um, building the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was um, a tactic that was really used to demonstrate that African Americans did want to be involved in the um, democratic process. They wanted to represent themselves. They wanted to come out and vote. It was a common misconception that um, Blacks didn't want to be involved, and that's why they weren't voting. Um, along those lines, there was also a huge voter registration initiative. Uh, volunteers would canvas and get people to vote. Um, teach people how to pass the uh, voting exam. So you used to have to take a test in order to be able to vote. It was one of the many loopholes that um, African Americans had to jump through in order to um, exercise their right to vote. Um, and also helping uh, 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 accompanying people to register to vote and then um, helping people who were experiencing retaliation for registering to vote Maybe they were fired, maybe um, they were physically attacked or their families were being threatened. The risk for your family to be involved in the movement. Um, and the last piece of um, Freedom Summer was in the Freedom Schools. And so the Freedom Schools, there were about 40 throughout uh, the state and they taught basic school subjects as well as 
um, African American literature and liberation theory, and also some um, really intense programs about understanding power structures, understanding how racial power played out and economic power, a lot of anti-capitalist um, theory was being taught, and um, also not nonviolence and some of those pieces that were core to the Southern Civil Rights Movement. Um, and as I mentioned before, this was a, a violent time. And um, in June of 1964, three civil rights workers, Andrew Goodman, and James Cheney and um, Mike Warner were kidnapped and murdered while they were uh, investigating a church bombing in Philadelphia, Mississippi. And um, and what this is a really famous case. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. What m other people don't know is that um, Mickey Schwerner's wife, Rita Schwerner, was also volunteering in the South at the time. They were both working for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, and I think it's important to pinpoint this case, one, because it's really well known, uh, two, because it exemplifies the huge risk that um, activists of all races were taking when they were participating in a civil rights movement, particularly at this time in this place. And also it demonstrates the very explicit tactic of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the clear decision that they made to bring white volunteers from the North to Mississippi because they knew that it would attract national media attention and start to catalyze action. Um, they knew that the federal government would send people in to investigate and that that attention would in turn protect more activists who were being targeted, um, especially Southern activists. This was a really uh, specific tactic that um, people really disagreed upon, but in the end it decided that they would use this tactic during the civil rights movement and during um, Freedom Summer specifically. And we also saw this in the Freedom Rides uh, a couple years earlier. Um, so any questions so far about Freedom Summer before we uh, start jumping into some of the other stuff? Okay. So um, what I wanna do now is look together at one of the primary source documents that is used to start out this lesson. And the reason I like this document is because um, a lot of our documents give the perspective of student activists, which is great. Um, and this offers the perspective of a parent. Um, so this was a letter written to an activist named Vivian Rothstein um, during a time that she was, this was actually the year after Freedom Summer, but a time that she was uh, in the South working for the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. So um, I'm not going to read this out loud. Just take a minute to read this to yourself. And then once you've read it, um, post some thoughts in the chat, either observations that you have about the letter and the language, and also um, sort of just pinpointing what you think the concerns of Vivian's dad are. So I'll give you a minute now to read that. So I see a few of you are typing in. Um, feel free, everyone, to jump in, or if you would prefer to participate by um, using your microphone, you can turn your microphone on and uh, share some of your thoughts. This is my favorite part is when you all get to um, comment on the stuff. That's when I really start to learn new things. So. What strikes you about this letter and um, what do you think are her father's main concerns here? <clears throat> yeah, so Marilyn saying, um, 
asking if in the slide we saw that her um, parents were Holocaust survivors and, and really feeling that in the letter, knowing that need to act. So um, just to go back, that her, her parents were, um, had fled Nazi Germany. So that, that's important to know. Um, and Ilana saying that the parent concern is so powerful. I remember when an Israeli father um, saying to his son who's going to war, if you're in doubt, shoot first. Um, so that's something about being a parent that uh, you're concerned about your child's safety. You might not necessarily be proud of that and you might still support the work that they're doing, but um, your biggest concern is about her and her safety. Um, and I think that that's a, a worthwhile narrative to explore, especially with young people who may be in conflict with their parents about activism or other things that, you know, that's, the parent has a different perspective and there has to be room for that. I'm just going to give another minute for a few um, Carol and Abra are typing in, so I want to make sure we don't move forward too much. Anything else that strikes you about um, this letter? Yeah, so Carol saying awareness of her safety as a female, so thinking about um, there's particular risk to women, to young people in these, um, in these instances. Yeah, and Abra building off of that, wrestling with this new role, a new role for his daughter and also a new role um, for women girls in activism. Um, that many women were involved in, uh, in direct action during the civil rights movement and, um, and that was, there was real risk for them there and that was different perhaps than in other places or parts of the movement. It's interesting, I was just reading something this morning about uh, the Freedom Schools part of Freedom Summer was dominated by women, whereas canvassing was usually more men were doing the canvassing because that was um, both more prestigious and a little bit more dangerous. So thinking about how gender plays out here is really important. Um, and the parallel that he draws to the uh, Children's Crusade, Marilyn said it's chilling. I, I definitely agree with that. So I, I like to start with this. Um, this letter because I think that um, the women who founded Wednesdays in Mississippi come from a really similar place, especially Polly Cowan, who um, her sons were activists in Freedom Summer themselves. But um, I like to have it as a frame for entering into this content. So here's a photograph of Polly Cowan um, and uh, She's on the left, and Dr. Dorothy Height is on the right, who um, was representing the National Council of Negro Women. Um, Polly Cowan was on the board, was a close friend and colleague of Dorothy Height, and the two of them um, started exploring this idea together in 1962 and 1963, and that work sort of culminated in Wednesdays in Mississippi, which started in 1964. Um, and here is a little excerpt of, now we're going to just look at an excerpt of um, an oral history that Dr. Height did talking about Polly Cowan. So I'm just, we're going to go paragraph by paragraph here. Again, I'll let you all read to yourselves and give my voice a break. Um, so once you read the paragraph, just post observations in the chat. So Marilyn is making this observation that communists here are antithetical to responsible people. Um, yeah, so as people who are maybe a little bit more left-leaning, 
communist doesn't seem like such a bad thing. It's important to note also here that um, communist uh, is used euphemistically or as code speak for Jew. So especially during this time period, and I think generally in American history, um, Jews were associated with ra radical thought and with communism, and it was a subtle way to infuse anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish uh, oppression into conversations about civil rights activism. Um, there's also something here as um, Ilana saying about um, being a parent and that through your children's activism, you became more conscious, you became more aware. We have a lot of kids who talk about, we have records of um, kids in the civil rights movement who talk about being raised with this social justice ethic, but that went both ways. So I think that that's a really powerful piece of this story. So I'm just gonna throw up the second paragraph here. And um, if I miss some of your comments in the chat, um, I'm sorry about that. We'll make sure that we post the chat log at the end so you'll be able to read over it and see if there's anything that um, you missed or wanted to think about more. Yeah, so Abra making the um, observation that maybe women weren't working or working full time or had different sort of roles, so that made them more able to participate as volunteers and activists. What about more in this second paragraph here? Yep. So we've got this reference to the Cadillac crowd, which says something about the class of these people. Um, these were people from the upper middle class, uh, people who were had political and economic power and also social connections to share. Um, something that I want to hold up here is also um, that the volunteers had to be willing to do something that furthers the movement. Um, and that they're going to be doing this together. So this isn't, they were really looking for a project and for people who weren't going to go in as do-gooders and sort of impose what they thought needed to be done on this community, but that they wanted people who wanted to build relationships, wanted to work with Southern uh, communities and really think about making real change. Um, and then this last paragraph I, I particularly love. I'll just give you a second to look at it. Yeah, and Abra's also bringing out this plan of action. They were very strategic. What was going to need to be done before, what they were going to do when they were there, and what they were going to do when they got home. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and in this last paragraph, what I love is um, thinking of women who had skills and thinking broadly about those skills, right? So here's someone who's a good storyteller. Um, thinking about all of the different kinds of skills that people had and bringing them in because of that for what they could uniquely offer. This is something that we know is distinctly a community organizing tactic, looking at who are the people, who are their social networks, what are those relationships, and how can they come in and work towards the shared goal. So I, I, love, I, I, I love that this really gives us insight into the tactical efforts of this group. Right, so storytellers, poets, writers, um, these people reach others in a different way than a political rally in action, registering to vote. Um, and that's important when we think about who they're gonna be working with. So we're gonna go on to that next part now. So a little bit more about, and feel free as I'm talking to keep chatting away, and when there's an opportunity to pause and pull some of that out, we will. So um, Wednesdays in Mississippi was sort of backed by a bunch of different big organizations. So the National Council of Negro Women was sort of the starting point, and then these other women's organizations came in and supported it, and they were particularly interested in going south working with those communities and really uncovering the truth about the conditions that um, women and young civil rights activists were facing so that they could 
mobilize people to action around alleviating some of that and helping further the civil rights cause. So they were really coming at it from this women's angle and they pulled on all of these different social connections through their faith communities, their um, work communities, their social networks, um, their political connections in order to leverage that power that they had. Um, we're going to look now, we have some wonderful film clips in this lesson from a forthcoming documentary about Wednesdays in Mississippi. Um, I'm not sure what's going on with the documentary right now, to be honest. I do know that they're um, still looking for some funding to help finish it. So um, we'll have the link to the documentary website on the webinar page when we email you afterward. If you're interested in learning more about the film or contacting them about how you can support this work and help get the story out there, please do that. Um, so this clip that we're going to watch is talking about Buddy and Elaine, who were uh, partners in, um, in, in Wednesdays in Mississippi. And um, I just want to say something briefly about the Southern Jewish experience. There's more about this in Unit 1, Lesson 3 in Living the Legacy, and you can do a lot of research about this online, also through the Institute of Southern Jewish Life. Um, but uh, there was violence on, um, against Jews in the South, and especially once Jews started to agitate for um, civil rights, there, there were Jewish institutions and Jewish individuals who were targeted specifically because of that. So in 1958, the temple in Atlanta was bombed um, and Jews faced economic and uh, threats of physical retaliation and actual physical retaliation also. So people who were business owners, people who were um, leaders in the community were risking very personally um, their livelihood and their family's safety when they were choosing to participate in the civil rights movement. And for, so for that, the decision to become involved wasn't easy um, and was something that really had to be made um, deliberately. There was a lot of social pressure also. Um, and also it's important to note that Jews fell on both sides of the civil rights struggle. So there were certainly Jews who didn't support uh, desegregation, who um, served on white citizens councils, which are sort of the white collar business owner, um, white supremacist groups that popped up around the South. Um, and it's important to uh, point that out when we're talking about this, that um, Jews have historically been on the side of justice and also on the side of injustice. And we have to claim those parts of our history too and wrestle with that a little bit. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna watch this um, film clip. So let me pull it up here. Okay. Mrs. Meyer came down. She stayed with us. Mrs. Crystal asked me, why was I there? Why did I think that people from the North could change local customs, local values? I feel that uh, Mrs. Myers felt that, uh, that there was not, we weren't doing enough. Uh, as Southern women, but we were doing the best we could. And How did that make you feel? I understood it. I understood that, uh, uh, that women coming down here could not understand uh, that we weren't out on the streets marching, that we were not uh, uh, that we were not doing as much as we might have done. Uh, and yet, I thought we were doing all that we could do. Elaine was also involved, like a lot of other Jewish women, with the effort to keep the public schools open in the time of integration. What happened in the South when the schools were integrated is the response of white segregationists was to either abandon or to shut down the public schools. I think it was difficult for those Southern Jews who had liberal thoughts, who cared much about equality, cared much about opportunity, uh, uh, cared much about the need for education in both communities. Uh, but they were also, to some extent, victims of the environment in which they found themselves. So I had some pressures uh, within the Jewish community and uh, 
within family, and I guess that was natural. The focus of peaceful integration was important because uh, we had to live what we were saying. Being a sort of racial liberal as a white person in Mississippi was a lonely business. <laughs> you know, to have the meanings, you know, with these northern women activists it was, I think, especially courageous. Okay. I'm going to toss up two discussion questions uh, here. And what I'd like you to do is just write in some reactions to either of these questions or just to the film clip in general. Um, but specifically thinking about what motivated these women, what role did Judaism play, and sort of how they may or may not represent the stereotypes that you might have um, about Northerners or Southerners. I see both Barbara and Marilyn are um, writing in. So just any observations um, that you all want to make about their motivations and the role of Judaism. Marilyn is saying um, that what she sees most is trying to maintain the balance between what they believe should be done, but understanding um, that they needed to still be in that community. Uh, yeah, so a big challenge for Southern Jews was Northern activists could come do their activism in Freedom Summer and leave. And they didn't have to live there. And that was a really, a real struggle for them. Um, and also this battle between the world as it is and the world as we think it should be. So no matter what our ideals are, we have to live in that reality. I think that we see that in the letter to Chicky where Vivian's father is writing to her. We also see that struggle between the way we believe things should be and the way that things really are and the um, fear, anxiety, and real risk that comes with that. Um, and uh, Barbara saying that it was their value of all human beings, that by speaking out for other people, the general population would hear and take similar or supportive action. So, you know, there's, in previous learning programs that we've done, we've called up this question of, are Jewish values humanist values? And um, how do we view values through a Jewish lens? And I think it's important to, uh, to wrestle with that question here and really think about, what our experience as American Jews, maybe what the experience of being Southern Jews um, added to a unique understanding about the value of equality, the value of freedom, the value of exercising your right to vote or having representation in your community. Um, and, and Abra holding up that even just for white people, especially white women to sit next to a black person in the South, that in and of itself was, um, challenging. Yeah, and Carol asking if they had talked about internalized racism. You know, I, I haven't found anything in the reading that I've done but um, so far about that, but I, that's definitely something that's at play here. So feel free to keep typing in. I want to say a little bit more of the tachlis, the practical um, aspects of how uh, Wednesdays in Mississippi was organized. And then I want us to watch one more clip before this session is over. So, um, so sorry, this is again, Polly Cowan and Dr. Dorothy Height. They uh, organized these teams of women pulling from the leadership of the various organizations that I mentioned before, and also looking as we saw in the oral history excerpt for additional notables selected from fields of law, medicine, education, community service, and arts and letters. So really thinking about all these different ways that people were um, 
all these different ways that people were able to engage with the uh, different communities in the South. So there were eight teams in total that came from these different cities, New York, Boston, Washington, DC, St. Paul, Minneapolis, and Chicago. So over the course of the summer, eight teams went with four to six women per team during July and August. Um, and they went down to Mississippi. Uh, here's a map. Again, the um, stars indicate the places where there were freedom projects happening. And um, the circles represent where Wednesdays and Mississippi teams went. And so um, the women from the northern cities came to Hattiesburg, Jackson, Vicksburg, Canton, Meridian, Greenville, um, Greenwood, and Laurel, and went to those communities specifically because there were women who they could meet with there who were their hostesses. So they stayed with Southern families while they were there. Um, and because there was there were freedom summer projects happening that they could go and observe. And so the way that this worked out is that um, there were three women who were living in Jackson permanently who ran Wednesdays in Mississippi, handled the logistics, communicated with people, made sure that there was always emergency contact information available. Um, and the teams from the north would get a study kit before. And that study kit had basic facts on Mississippi, um, information about the city that the team was going to visit, background on the local civil rights projects, and um, also a selected bibliography on Southern attitudes. So some information about who these people are and why they might feel or believe or act differently than we do as Northerners. So we, then they would on Tuesdays travel down to Mississippi and meet up with their hosts. And the way that these participants describe it is they didn't even acknowledge each other. The white women went with the white representatives and the black women went with the black representatives and they did their work. As when they were in the South, they did their work in these racially respective communities. And that was really important for maintaining the sense of security that was fundamental in doing the work with this group of people. Then during the trip, they would meet with their hostess, gather impressions from her, from her friends, from her family and community, talk with her a little bit. And then they would go visit the Freedom Summer projects. They would talk to the activists, find out what their experiences had been, learn about harassment or violence, the challenges that were facing them, what needs they had um, in terms of supplies and other support. And then they would take that information that they had learned from the activists and bring it back to their hostess. And they would have some conversations with her and appeal to her and her network um, to help make a difference in these local communities and agitate a little bit to push those women to um, get involved. And what happened was the Northern women could essentially be a buffer and a conduit between um, these two communities in a way that created definitely a sense of security and, um, and gave sort of a foot in the door for these women who had a lot of barriers to becoming involved to feel um, more excited, not, I don't know if excited is the world, but more ab able to get involved. And then this is important to note also, after the trip, these women were expected to write up a debrief about their visit, including names of potential contacts for future visits or for future partnership, as well as people who maybe um, were not as supportive of, of the work. And it, if you look in the documents, it says, be sure not to write this down in front of your hostess, right? So there's something really about respecting that person's hospitality, respecting their perspective, but also knowing that you're there to do something and that has to be effective. So documenting that and sharing it. Um, and then when you come back to the North, reaching out to your community, helping figure out how to further the cause, whether that's by building relationships among your friends, helping collect supplies, doing some sort of lobbying. Um, there were different ways that women got involved on the way home. Um, yeah, so, and Abra saying this helps understand the not just a sightseer comment. So this was really, the goal of this project was really to use relationships to leverage power. And in that way, it's really um, organizing, community organizing at, at its purest form, um, which is, I think, really inspiring. So um, I want us to watch another film clip now. Um, this is an excerpt of a one of the other film clips in the lesson plan. Um, and, oh, before we watch this film clip, I just wanna, 1964 and Freedom Summer in Wednesdays in Mississippi was happening right after uh, The Feminine Mystique was published. So here's this 
groundbreaking book that comes out about the experience of women. It's at a time where women are really thinking about their roles. That's really changing and lots of different um, energies and events are sort of galvanizing or catalyzing this shift in the role of women and the way that women perceive themselves. And I think that there's something really profound and there's absolutely a connection between Wednesdays in Mississippi and the fact that there was this other sort of parallel consciousness raising um, experience that women were having at the time. Um, and especially women who were in this subset of Wednesdays in Mississippi women, the Cadillac cloud, Cadillac crowd, people who are well-educated, they're women who are wearing fancy hats and pearls and their nice dresses and they're coming down and meeting with each other over tea. Um, so I, I just wanted to hold that up before we watch this clip. So let me pull up the clip here and we will take a look. Liberation was even coined. We in SNCC sort of looked on the ladies from the North, you know, bougie ladies with a liberal idea. It wasn't revolutionary the way we thought, you know, we were going to be. Why would they bother then to work with these women, you might say? Why not just work with SNCC? Why bother to work with these women in the black community and the white community? And the answer is, as change began to happen in the South, it was the women who would have to pick up the pieces. They were just as dangerous as we were in SNCC. And there was a way probably which they were more dangerous in that they came with power behind them, you know, of their connections. They were successful because they brought white women and black women working together and changed institutions. It's not voter registration. It's how do you change education? How do you change the lives of the people who live there? Women working with women have created change in so many places. This was one of the first efforts at doing that. And it came from Polly and Dorothy Height, you know, thinking together, what can black and white women do together to make a difference? Okay. So again, um, I'm going to just give us a moment to react. So these are the discussion questions. I pulled these from the uh, curriculum. So just if you could for a minute, just type into the chat or speak up and um, share a little bit about um, what the women's volunteers and the historians who spoke in the video see as being significant about the women working together and then share whether or not you think that that's significant and share a little bit about why. Um, and then this other part, this is one of my favorite parts in the film clip um, when Rabbi Rachel Cowan um, who later becomes Polly Cowan's daughter-in-law. So this is, she's talking about a time before she was Polly Cowan's daughter-in-law, um, talks about, you know, the bougie ladies with a liberal idea. And then later with the, with perspective and as a historian, with the historical perspective rather, sees really these women were doing something that was dangerous and radical. So just share your thoughts, I think, on, on either of those, um, ideas or hold up any questions maybe that you have from that clip. I see a lot of people are typing in, so. So Marilyn saying they used the common plane of women's experiences to cross the divide of racial differences. Um, and like in Congress, there are times when women can build unique bridges because it's a woman to woman project. So yeah, drawing on what can be universal about that experience. Um, there's also this quote uh, that um, Polly Cowan Schulman makes as change began to happen in the South, it was the women who would have to pick up the pieces. So there's something unique about the role of women, the role women play in families and communities and the impact that change has on women and their role in cleaning up after it, supporting it or working against it. Um, and also the Barbara mentioned, mentioning the cooperation of different classes within the white population perhaps helped to see some commonalities 
um, across the rich and poor of women's populations. So certainly there's a lot of intersectionality happening during this time, um, which I think fueled the general energy of the civil rights movement in the South. Um, and Carol making this distinction between working inside or outside of the system, right? So voter registration was really important. Institutional change is also important and it takes different people with different talents and different approaches to make those two kinds of change in order to get to the ultimate goal. Absolutely. Yeah, and so this is, you know, we know um, that civil rights, the civil rights movement and activism, especially on the part of women within that movement, really fueled second wave feminism. That um, this was a place where uh, many women were um, cutting their teeth or wetting their feet in organizing and activism, their experiences within the civil rights movement as um, secretaries or being treated as second class volunteers or citizens within that group really led to their understanding of more liberation movements and other pieces of freedom that um, we haven't achieved yet. Um, and Abra saying, remember that the more affluent white women were married to the men who respected them and were the men with power inside these institutions. Um, so remembering the influence of wives on their husbands cannot be overlooked. And that's certainly true. Wives on their husbands, women, mothers on their sons, aunts on their nephews and nieces, um, on your brother or sister, that those familial relationships were hugely important here, especially in places where power structures played through those social circles um, and where uh, in, in the South, uh, there was a deep sense of community, a deep sense of family, and those relationships were extremely important. Um, Marilyn asking, I wonder if this caused conflict with women's marriages. Um, and, and there's certainly a real risk that was taken it didn't have to be you as an activist in order for you to be retaliated against. So if your kid was active in the civil rights movement, someone might call up your house and say, listen, your son was at a protest. You better get him to stop doing that or we're going to come over to your house. So there, I'm sure that these kinds of this kind of activism created some tension there. Um, and yeah, Something about building power one person to the next person to the next person and weaving that power through this uh, community network, I think is really, um, really powerful. And it's something that they took out of theory and really put into action here. So um, I wanna, I had planned for us to look now at another um, oral history excerpt, but this, um, this excerpt I think pretty much sums up a lot of the other things that we've been talking about. So. I'm going to skip over that and I want us to leave, I want to leave us some time here for uh, a little bit more discussion um, sharing um, some questions and some insights either about any of this content that we've looked at and also about these two last questions that I'm going to throw up on the screen here. So one about um, how this model of activism seems relevant or applicable today. Um, and what issues galvanize your community? And Mer Miriam is actually going to put um, into the chat a link to the Lino board. Um, so go ahead and click, click in the chat. There's this Lino board. So go ahead and click on that. We're using this Lino board tool is because um, it allows you all to come back and add and also to look at the discussion that we've had. Um, in a little bit more of a dynamic way in case you want to build off of this in any of your programs. So go ahead and click on that link. And I know some of you have used this before. In the top right corner, you'll see a little um, sort of toolbox of sticky notes. So if you click on one of those notes, it'll allow you to write in one, and then you can post it to the board and just share um, insights or ideas in yellow and questions that you might have in green um, about what seems relevant or applicable from this model and what issues seem to be the burning issues in your community. Um, oh, I should say one other thing, which is um, some people also need a little bit more time to think through 
these questions and ideas. So anything that has come up for you is fair game to post on this lino board. I just wanted to give people a different way to engage in the discussion. Um, and if you want to see what people are posting, you can hit the refresh button and it should show um, show the sticky notes. I'm going to go ahead and throw this. Are people able to use the Lino board? If you're finding it's too complicated to use the Lino, you can also just um, post in the chat. Okay, so someone's posting that a, um, an issue that's gaining traction in their community right now is human trafficking um, and going to an interfaith event about identifying that issue. Yeah, that's certainly uh, something that's on the rise in terms of thinking about current civil rights and human rights issues. What else is coming up for people here? Does this sort of tactic or strategy feel like it's something that would be replicable, replicable in your community? Yeah, so people posting about um, choices on acting from love and caring are different from acting from anger. So thinking about those different feelings that come up for us and the responses that they might have. Um, and that using personal stories, first person narratives, visuals, um, helps our students, especially students, if you have young, you know, students who weren't al alive during this time period, helps them understand a little bit better what was happening, absolutely. Um, and another question, how often did families travel south and we're active together. Um, Wilma writing into the chat about her community, um, which is working on ending the new Jim Crow and mass incarceration issues, um, and noting that most of the leadership there is women, interracial, uh, work in, women working black and white together. Yeah, so mass incarceration and recidivism is definitely another um, big issue that's been coming up a lot. So um, feel free to keep posting to this lino even after the program if you have more thoughts that you want to toss into this conversation. Um, and I just want to end by mentioning a great opportunity for those of you who are working with middle and high school students or perhaps know others who are working with middle and high school students. The Natalia Tversky Educator Award is um, offered by JWA each year. The um, Teacher who wins the award gets $2,500 plus $500 for their school or program. Um, and what you do is submit an original lesson plan that uses primary source documents in a creative way to help your students engage with the stories and experiences of American Jewish women. Um, and uh, this is a really fantastic opportunity for you. Um, it's also a great chance to sort of push yourself outside of your comfort zone, have a deadline to try something new if an idea has been coalescing um, in your head. Here's a chance to get it down on paper um, and uh, get some real feedback about um, the work that you're doing. If you're interested in hashing out ideas for the Torsky Award, I would love to speak with you further. You can also, Miriam's going to post the link to our um, online community, the JWA National Educators Network, which is on Facebook. So I really encourage those of you who aren't members yet to um, 
click that link and join the Facebook group. It's a great place to uh, post questions and ideas. And also a lot of teachers lately have been sharing pictures and anecdotes and links to resources that they've been using or lesson plans that they've been making. So it's a great place to share um, ideas. I want to acknowledge that we have a, about three minutes left before the hour is up. Um, so we're right on time in that respect. And I want to um, welcome any questions that maybe you all have left before, um, before we sign off for the day. And uh, thank you all for coming. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Um, Miriam has also posted the link to our SurveyMonkey survey. So we try to evaluate all of our programs here, make sure um, that we're modifying them to fit your needs as best as we can. So please take a minute to fill out that survey. Um, it's the last link that Miriam posted. And um, feel free to be in touch with us anytime. Thank you all so much for coming. And I hope that you find a way to bring this story to your communities. As I mentioned, it's one of my favorites. I find it um, really inspiring and also um, pushes me to think about how I'm living out this legacy in my own life. So thank you again for coming. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Ah, Barbara, I see Barbara, you're writing in with a question about um, how communities address or balance needs within the community and the needs without or outside of the community. Um, yeah, that's a that's a question I think that is an age old activist question. Um, and I think it's something that really has to be wrestled with by with the individuals. So um, I'm interested in hearing any insights that you might have as you continue to explore that. Thank you so much for coming. This was great. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great day. And for those of you who are in the cold, stay warm. For those of you who are in the warm, enjoy it.